Good evening. Thank you all, the, you at home, visiting with us for, with our live Facebook broadcast. And thank all of you for being here tonight in our sanctuary for our Wednesday night Bible study. And I invite you, if you will, take your Bibles. Let's go to John chapter 8. We're going to be starting off tonight looking at 31 through 38. So John chapter 8. And then we're going to skip over and look at the opening verses of chapter 9. And while you're going to John 8, 31, I'm going to give this time now to God. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, as we are opening up our Bibles for this very special time of study, I ask that also through the power of your Spirit that you now open us up, that you will open up our hearts and our minds, our spirits and our souls, dear God, to you and to your message for us tonight. So bless us as only you and you alone can do. Give us something new tonight. Give us that meat that we crave so that we can be strengthened to go forth, especially during this time, to go forth and continue to serve and honor you in everything that we do. So once again, now bless us. You lead us, guide us, and direct us as once again we place ourselves into your loving, life-giving hands. And we ask this now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, you join me there beginning at chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will, you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me, because there is no place in you for my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence, as for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. All right, so when we were together last week, we finished up there with verse 33, talking about how Jesus is saying, you know, the truth will set you free. And at that promise of being set free, we talked about the fact that the Jews that are there at that moment, what do they do? They basically lose their minds. They come unglued because... They're descendants of Abraham. They've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean we will be made free? And we talked about last week about the fact that what they're saying is not really true. That they have been, Israel, Judah, has always been a bondage of slavery many times. The Egyptians and the Babylonians and so forth through that. But in their hearts and in their minds, they were actually making a true statement that even though they have been under the bondage of slavery to other nations, they've always held on to that true spirit of independence, that they may have been slaves in the body, but they were always free in the spirit. Now let's begin tonight with verse 34, okay? Because the truth is, Jesus was talking about a different kind of slavery. And in doing this, he's seeking to drive home a far deeper issue. So Jesus, the freedom he was talking about, is talking about the free from being a slave to what then? Sin. To sin. All right? It's not about nations. This is about slavery to sin. Now, in talking about all this, there's something else I want to do. First, I want to find an answer to this question. What does it mean to be a slave? You see, there are times when someone, you know, their sin is pointed out to them, right? They're pointed out to him or her. They're warned about the danger or the problem of their sin. And what happens so many times when somebody, their sin is pointed out, the first off, we hope that they're going to say what? That they're what? They're, well, they're sorry and ask for forgiveness for what they've done. But let's look at this from a different point of view and a different mindset. What about, first off, the person 
who doesn't care about such things? Why do you think is the response that they're actually going to have in their hearts and in their minds? If you go to them and say, this is the sin you are committing, they don't really care. What is their response, do you think? Huh? Well, yeah, they can be angry, but they can also then, what might be their response in a personal way? They'll say, I will do what? Um, well, how about the, uh, most people out there are going to say, I'll do what I want to do. It's none of your business. I'll do what I like to do, okay? And it's this way of thinking or believing, which is the whole point then about this, okay? Because the person who sins is not really doing what he or she likes, okay? The person that sins is actually doing what? Not doing what he or she wants, but they're actually doing what? What the devil wants, or they're doing what sin wants them or likes them to do, okay? You see, a person can let a desire. You can let a habit, okay? You may have a habit in your life, and you can let that desire, that habit, get such a grip on you that you get to the point you cannot break it. If you become that way, you can just let it grab on you and it, you can't break it. Or worse, you can allow a pleasure to become so powerful over you that you find yourself unable to do without it. As a result, you end up doing what? You lose power. You lose all power to what that sin wants you to do. And in the end, that Sin actually becomes a what to you? Huh? An addiction, it sounds like. And, uh, what I said then? An addiction. And, well, not just an addiction, but even more important, in, in reference to slavery to sin, right. that, huh? Right. It becomes your master. Remember Jesus talking about you cannot serve two masters? That's kind of what this is about. That if you allow this to get such a grip on you, yeah, you're right, Christina, addic an addiction is a part of this, okay? All right? But the bottom line is, you lose all power to that, it becomes the master. And then you become a slave to that sin. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. This is the point of it all, okay? That no one who sins can ever be said to be free because, in reality, you are, in fact, now a slave to that sin. And in turn, as you are placing yourself under submission to it, that sin becomes your master. But what this statement that Jesus just made is even more than that, okay? There's even something greater that Jesus is trying to point out, okay? Now, he is now placing the Jewish people, those that are there, He's now placing the Jewish people into a category that they would never place themselves, okay? Now, he's not placing them in the category of being a slave, but being in the category of what? The category of being a, not a slave, but a... I was going to say like everyone else. Well, okay, not just everyone else. Well, everyone else is a what? We're a what? We're a sinner. He's not telling them that they're slaves. He is pointing out, okay, putting them in the category of being sinners. And this is important, okay? Because this is where it all ties in. Why do you think they would never say this about themselves? I mean, you and I are quick, right? Well, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am a sinner, okay? But the thing is, why do you think they wouldn't say this about themselves? Not because they are God's chosen people, but why? You know, some people will say, well, they think they're God's chosen people. But that's not the reason why they came to believe that they were not sinners. It's because they are what? And what's, who's been the other name mentioned in this? Abraham. Abraham. It's not that they're God's chosen people. They think this way because they are descendants, because they are children of Abraham, okay? They don't think they're sinners because they're children of Abraham. 
That's within verse 37. Look at verse 37. Now with this verse, we see Jesus now, one of the books said, dealing a death blow. <laughs> dealing a death blow to this important claim by the Jewish people. And like I said, now for the Jewish people, you see, Abraham was the pinnacle. He was the top within their religion, not just their religion, also their religious history. Because of Abraham's greatness, the Jewish people considered themselves to be safe and secure within the one, the favor of God. You know, they thought they were favored by God because they're children of Abraham. Now, the Jewish people, now I'll just make this point clear, okay? The Jewish people were not wrong in their admiration of Abraham. In spite of his failures, and he made a lot of mistakes, he made a lot of failures along the way, he was still a truly great religious man. And he stands as a giant, not only within Jewish religious history, he also stands as a giant within all the religious history of all mankind, which also includes who? Us. It includes our Christian religious history, okay? Abraham has been in our part as well, okay? Because he's the one that originally heard the call of God. He did what had never been done that you didn't do. He left home. You always stayed there, but remember, he left Ur because God called him to go. And so he's the first one. He's a big part of our Christian religion. But because of all this, their belief now in this greatness of Abraham has now become misguided. See, they placed Abraham on such a high pedestal that they've now come to believe that he has gained such importance, that he's gained such goodness, that this distinction is not only sufficient for him personally and in his own relationship with God, but it's also great enough to cover who? All them. Them. All his descendants, okay? You see, by this time, they've convinced themselves, all right? By this time, they've now convinced themselves that Abraham's goodness was so great that he, in his own way, he built up a kind of a treasure, <laughs> a treasury of goodness and forgiveness. And out of that treasury, they can now do what? They can draw out what they need. They can draw out what they need to cover. And this is what Jesus is first off pointing out to them, that it's not about just because you're a descendant of Abraham, okay? It's about your own relationship about who are you going to allow to be your master? Who are you going to allow to either be your master to make you a slave, or are you going to trust in the one who can be your true master and set you free? But the bottom line is this, you can't do that on the coattail of somebody else. You cannot draw your own salvation out of somebody else's salvation. Same thing about I said, I would love it if I could have gotten it from my mom and dad. You know, could just take it from theirs and put it on myself and gone on. Same thing in the church. There's a lot of people who think, well, just simply because I'm a member of such and such church, then I'm okay now. And I'll just get into heaven. I can act. I can do. I can say anything I want to do. Because after all, I'm a member. I'm a, I'm a lifetime member of this church. But that's not what saves you. You cannot trust it in somebody else. You have to trust in Jesus, to let him be your true master in all this, okay? And then Jesus points all this out. Go back then to verse 35 and 36. In 35 and 36, look at those verses with me for a moment here. And then answer this. So how does Jesus show that this kind of belief in not just Abraham, but if you see, if you got that kind of belief in your preacher or your parents or your church, how is this way of believing things wrong, okay? Well, actually here, he does it in two ways. First off, he does it when he refers to himself as what? Huh? Okay, more than just the son, 
The son of what? Son of God. Not more. He didn't say son of God here. He says the son of what? Of the what? House. Of the house. Or mine has household. All right, first off he says, because I'm the son of the household. Now, how does this place Jesus above Abraham to where he's the one we should trust in? Well, see, the one thing that Abraham never claimed, no matter what happened, he never claimed about himself or never even tried to claim about himself was what? That he was never the one, the son. He was never the son. He was not the Messiah. But more, most importantly, he never claimed what? He never claimed to be equal to God. You know, he never put himself even equal to God or being the son. He was always the what? The servant. All right? But the son, the son who is the son of the house, of the household, he is the one who can then do what? Make them free. Make them free. He's the one that can set the slave free. How can the son do that? First off, he does what? There in verse 35. First off, he can do it because of what? Because of his what? The son abides forever. Okay, the son abides forever. Where? He, huh? Well, but also in the what? In the house. In the, house. <laughs> the son is always there. He's always a permanent, forever part of the household, okay? But also the son has the ability to set the slave free. Why? Because the oldest son, or in this case, the only son, also has the ability to speak with what? Authority from the father. Authority of the father. Not just authority, but the authority of the father. Remember, the son had that authority. He had that authority that was given to him as the oldest or the older son. Remember Jacob and Esau. Huh? And you're right. They're hearing this. Yeah, they're, not, they're hearing this, and it's clicking a lot better than it does for us, okay? Because remember, this is all stuff the way they saw things in their society. They knew all this. So the thing is, first off, he lets them know this is wrong because... You can't get this with the servant. You can only get it with the son. Secondly, you know, the second thing that Jesus does to show the people how wrong they are. Look back at verse 37, where he admits to what? That they are descendants of Abraham. All right. He, at first, you know, he has no problem. There in verse 37, acknowledging that they are what kind of descendants from Abraham? Not spiritual, but physical. physical. He doesn't have a problem. He knows that you are physically descended from Abraham. All right? But their behavior, especially in the way they saw Jesus, showed what? That they, that, huh? that they won't kill him. All right? Yeah. Hold on to that thought. I'm coming back to you in a moment. Okay? The thing is that, that spiritually... They now have a father who is what? Not God, not good, but evil, you know, but it's the devil. They now have that kind of father. And he proves that there in the last first part of verse 37 because of what, Mr. Harold? They wanted to kill him. There was no place with them yeah. for God's word. There was, they want to kill him because they, they still don't do what? They don't believe. They don't believe, they don't, and they don't recognize him. That's the main thing, is that they don't recognize him. He can prove, he's showing, that you, you, know, you may be physically descended of Abraham, but you're not spiritually connected to Abraham. Because you have a father that is evil. Because you want to kill me, okay? Now, it's believed that all this could also be a reference to an event that happened in Abraham's life Recorded in our Genesis chapter 18. Now remember, Marshall, you're right. You remember a lot of times when they're doing things and Jesus is talking to a Jewish person back then, they knew all this stuff. And they know all the stories. 
And so their minds quickly go back to specific events, especially with Abraham. Now in Genesis chapter 18, they're hearing this, and so most likely they're going to Genesis 18. Now, Genesis 18, that's where God comes to Abraham's camp in the form of what? Do you remember? Three what? Amen. Three men. Or let's call them messengers for the sake of this, okay? But three men, three messengers, okay? Now, this is where God, through these three men, these three messengers, first off, they tell Abraham about what dealing with Sarah. That Sarah's going to do what? Going to have a baby. She's up in age and she laughs about it when she hears it, okay? This is where he also hears the news about Sodom and Gomorrah, about the judgment that's been placed upon them. But what I want you to do is put your hand here, John, and flip back to Genesis 18 with me. Go back to, you know, back to the first book there, Genesis chapter 18. And I want us to look at Genesis 18, 1 through 8. So go to Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Okay, now follow along with me. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk of the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. All right, let's stop there. So the question is this. How did Abraham receive these three men, these three messengers? As messengers from God. As messengers from God. But he also, in another way, did what? He welcomed them. He was excited. He welcomed them into the camp. And he did what? He made them feel welcome. He accepted them because he knew who they were. All right? So the thing is this. In seeking to kill him, the Jews are also now seeking to kill who? Not just the Son of God, but God's what? Messenger. God's messenger. If they were any children of God, I mean, I'm saying children of Abraham, if they were any kind of children of Abraham, how could they explain their desire to want to now kill God's true messenger? When Abraham welcomed, God's messenger in. And in wanting to kill God's messenger, they now show two things. First off, that their conduct is the exact opposite of who Abraham was. They're doing the exact same, the, the opposite thing, okay? And secondly, that their behavior, their desire now proves what? It proves who their what is. Their true father is. That it's not God. Because Abraham believed in God. Abraham received God's message. And if you say you're a descendant of Abraham, then how can you say that? Then you're not even acting like him. That's why it's so important we have to act like Jesus. Yeah, but Abraham didn't either. Abraham just had his faith in God. You know, remember the Holy, the Holy Spirit's been around, but it hasn't come in its full force until Pentecost. You know, so the thing is, but Abraham recognized God. He recognized God's messengers. They have the same opportunity. But instead of trusting in the Father and trusting in Abraham's heavenly Father, not Abraham himself, they've 
They put Abraham in such a place where they've actually put him above God, just like they were doing with the laws. And they've taken God out of the mix. And because of that, they've forgotten about God. But then now, go back to what Mr. Hare also said earlier. Go back now to the last part, verse 38. Okay? Jesus then brings everything back to the one thing that's standing in the way of them still believing in him. It's the one sin that he's been warning them all about. What's the big sin? The sin of not doing what? But not just believing Jesus, but believing what? Not doing the works of the Father. Not doing the work of the Father. But what we talked about last week and what we learned in the, in the other verses is what hurts Jesus is the fact that they don't believe who he says that he is. Remember, he's asking, you know, he's talking about, uh, I declare what I've seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you've heard from the Father. But see, they still what? They don't believe. It's not that they don't believe in him. They don't believe that Jesus is who he says that he is. That's what we have to do. It's more than about believing in Jesus. It's opening yourself up to the fact because you know he's the one. The one from God. That he is the one that can truly set you free. Because of who he says that he is. Okay? So, we, and if you were to go on, they continue on this, but I'm going to skip this now. And I want to go on to chapter 9. So let's go on now to one, another great story here in John. It's the man born blind who received sight. So join me at chapter 9 here. So as he walked along, he saw a man, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Okay, let's stop there because we're almost out of time. But now, look at verses, if we go into verses 1 and 2. First off, like I said, they see this man born blind. Verse 2, and seeing the man, the pain, you know, they ask, who sinned? Disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, the thing that's always brought up is this, this question. Why the disciples would ask such a question? Why would they ask such a question. But the truth is, for people back in this time, for people back in this time, this was a question that was asked many, many times. And the reason why they asked it was simply because of this, that the Jewish people, without hesitation, had always connected what? To sin, suffering. They've always connected suffering and sin together. They always put suffering and sin together because the basic assumption, the basic assumption has always been that whenever, whatever, there was, you know, there was any kind of suffering, that sin was the cause of it. Sin was the cause of the suffering. It didn't matter if someone had been born blind, you were born deaf, or you were born crippled. They didn't think about the physical causes because it's all, as far as they were concerned, sin Caused it. Now, in response to though this thought, then you know as to why they would ask you, the Jewish religious leaders actually back in this time they taught two answers to this question. There are two answers they had to the question. First off, the Jewish a lot of the Jewish religious leaders they believed in what they called the concept of prenatal sin. They believed in prenatal sin. Okay. That you've sinned even before you left the womb. See, those that taught this actually believed that a person could begin to commit acts of sin when he or she was still in the mother's womb. And a big reason for this teaching could be found in the story of what two babies? I mentioned them a little bit ago. What two babies? Jacob and Esau. In the birth, okay? You go to Genesis chapter 25. Verses 19 through 28. You don't have to do that right now. But if you go back to Genesis 25, 19 through 28, here we are told that they're already beginning to fight there in Rebecca's womb even before they're born. 
They're already at each other. God then comes and explains to her that she actually has two individual different nations already at, you know, within her womb that these two children are representing. And the thing is, nations spend, what, more time fighting than they did getting along. And then, what happens when they were born? It's not like one was born and a few minutes later, another one was born. What happens when they're born? Jacob grabs his head. Jacob, I mean, the, as Esau is coming out, Jacob is holding on to him. And put, pulled out at the same time. He's holding on to his heel. So the thing is, that kind of belief, you can kind of see, can't you? Where that might come up to where they're thinking, well, you know, if they're already that active, it could be prenatal sin. But there's still a lot of no's about that. But secondly, there was the teaching that a person's sin was due to the sins of the who? Uh, not just father, but the parent, okay? Well, you're kind of right that the idea that a child can inherit the consequences of their parents' sin, it did come from the Old Testament itself, where the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. A number of different passages Three of them, well, one is in Psalm 109, verse 14. Another one is found in Isaiah chapter 65, verses 6 and 7. But the best known scripture of this is what? Do you remember? It's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. This is the listing of the Ten Commandments. And in the very first commandment, there in the first three, four, five verses, you know, it's the commandment where God says, do not have any other gods, do not have any idols before me. And then he concludes all that with Exodus 25. For I am the Lord your God, for, I'm sorry, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents, to which generations do you remember? Third and what? Fourth generations of those who reject me, okay? But the thing is this, is that really what God means? Is that really what God means when he says this about sin being passed from a parent to the third or fourth generations? Well, I don't know about you, but that's not the God I know. That's not the God I love. That's not the God I believe in. Now see, this is, uh, this is not about God passing on their sins like that. This is not the God I love. No, this is about the consequences to the one, the choice of sin. You know, we always talk about the choice, but we never think about the consequence, right? I mean, it's just like every time Sandy and I, we go to maybe get a new car. And I get all excited. We're going to get a new car. But you know what I always forget about? I got to still pay taxes on that thing. You know, we got to do, you know, you forget about all the other consequences that go with, hey, I just got a brand new car. I gotta pay taxes. We forget about that. There are consequences. And that's what this is about. It's about the consequences of the choices in. The choices we make in our life can not only affect us, but it can also affect who? The children down the road. Children, you know, generations after generations. What we do today can affect others. That's why when people say, well, what I do in the privacy of my own home doesn't hurt anybody. But the thing is, there's always consequences. Whether you're doing it in the public or you're doing it in the privacy of your own home, there is always a consequence. And that consequence always can end up affecting others, even three, four generations down the road, okay? So it can't, you know, it's not about passing this on. But more importantly, the prophet Ezekiel makes a strong case against a parent's sin being placed upon their children. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, the prophet points out individual responsibility when it comes to an act of sin. But more importantly, that sinners will be punished for their own sins, while the innocent will not be punished for the sins of others. Basically what he says is this. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Okay? And so what we see here is that even though this was a common thought, it had been taught many different ways, and these are just the two top ones. 
There were like three or four different things I read, and I said, I'm not going to go into all of this. This is so it's just kind of crazy. But uh, these two things right here were very well known and thought about. So for them to ask this question, it wasn't, well, you know, what are you thinking? This was something that was among the people, like Marcia pointed out. When they asked this and everything, they thought they were asking a good question. You know, they were trying to get an answer to a good question. Then we get to verse 3. We get into Jesus' response to the question, and that's where we're going to pick up in next week. So let's stop here. We'll stop at this point, and we'll pick up then with verse 3 next week as we begin to tear apart Jesus' answer to all this, okay? So thank y'all for being here. I want to thank everybody that joined us online on Facebook tonight and be a part of our YouTube channel later on. Thank you for being here. Hope you enjoy us. We'll join us for church this Sunday. So take care. God bless and goodbye.